to give us an update uh, on what they are doing. But I would like to uh, ask for the privilege of asking Mr. Harbison to come to the podium and giving us a little bit of the great news we got today from the Promise Zone. That's a great program that the MDHA worked so hard to make happen, and, and I think you all will be very proud. Rosie is passing around the information about it. Can you hear me now? Oh, my. Yes, okay. Well, first, this is a team effort. It's not just MDHA. So I appreciate the support. We had council members sign on. We had 87 uh, partners uh, and then six specific nonprofits, along with the mayor's office, and an application for a thing called a Promise Zone. It went in last November. Uh, we were in competing with 200 other cities in the, in the United States. And along with four of the cities, the president awarded Promise Zone designation to Nashville today. What that specifically means is on every federal grant application for coming from that Promise Zone, not just for housing, for education, for justice uh, grants, for any grant, we get preferential points. Our community gets preferential points. They vary. The, limit, the, the smallest amount would be about two percentage points. The largest would be five. Um, it makes you very, very more competitive for all your grant applications. Um, we will receive uh, five uh, staff members to MDHA to, uh, that we, of course, will use for the community to help with, with the reporting that's required for Promise Zones. Um, and we'll get a full-time counselor uh, from the federal government to assist in grant applications for our community. So um, while there's no immediate financial um, award for the other, uh, there's been 12 other uh, grantees in the past, and over the period of time this has been in place, about a year and a half, they've received $500 million in grants, and they get preferential treatment. So uh, it was important for us. Um, we've had a lot of help from a lot of people, and I think it bodes well for us in the future for um, grants in both education, jobs, training, uh, affordable housing, and others. So that's kind of the summary. And uh, just thanks to our partners. I mean, Martha O'Brien, Conexion Americas, uh, there's a host of people on that list, and they've really done a lot of heavy lifting. MDHA was just a facilitator, but thank you. Well, thank you. And, and I, I wanted people to know, and also people are watching on TV, that you guys are always working and pushing the envelope and trying to find better ways to address the issues in Nashville. So we appreciate the work you do. So who wants to go first? All right, so Mr. Eric Cole with the mayor's office will be the, the first one. Thank you, Chairman uh, and members of the committee. Um, we kind of want to just give a synopsis update of the work that kind of variety of metro entities are doing related to your priorities and certainly the mayor's priorities around affordable and, and workforce housing. Um, couple of things I know this committee and, and council members are interested in. Um, one is, uh, I think the, there's a forthcoming resolution to ask for a comprehensive um, housing plan um, from our office, um, which I'm, I'm pleased to report to you all that work is already underway, so we think we can certainly comply with your request. I think the mayor addressed some of that in um, her state of Metro speech uh, as well, but um, we're looking forward to working with you on that going forward. Um, quick update related to the Barnes Fund um, for affordable housing and the commission, the Metropolitan Housing Trust Fund Commission that administers the Barnes Fund. Um, that commission has been very active in the last uh, month since the budget was um, introduced and the concept of an additional $10 million in the Barnes Fund was introduced from the mayor, as, which would take us to about a $16 million fund for this coming fiscal year. Um, the commission has asked us as staff and working with the leadership of the commission to figure out a number of pieces of how um, the trust fund will administer and we will administer um, those dollars. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that progress has been um, positive. Councilman Sledge is your representative or the council's representative on um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Commission and has been really helpful and a, a real leader in those meetings as well. 
we're really looking, I think the commission is looking at Barnes Fund dollars as being targeted at 80% of area median income and below. That's the same amount that was, uh, that's the same level that was targeted in the initial Barnes Fund legislation. And also continuing the, that money to be grants uh, to nonprofit agencies. Um, not at this point seeking to change anything related to Barnes in terms of funding for profits, for profit developers, et cetera. A um, lot of conversation though around the prioritization of um, homeowner and rental rehab grants, which I know is, is, a, is, is a topic that's near and dear to a number of you. Um, as well as some creative financing concepts that um, the Barnes Fund could consider, but I think the, the, the preliminary chunk of those dollars, that 10 million, would continue to be used for uh, new construction, acquisition, rehab by rental, uh, for rental and homeowner projects by nonprofit developers. That's the, that's the way the fund is tagged. We think we have plenty of work to do within that spectrum. So that work is ongoing. Councilman Sledge, I know, is gonna work with you all and, and uh, your council on creating a piece of legislation to kind of align with the Barnes Fund progress and we're excited to continue doing that work together. We've had a couple work sessions. We have another one coming up this Thursday uh, from nine to noon um, for the Housing Trust Fund Commission to work through some of those items. I'm sorry, I can't remember if the meeting's here or at um, Lindsley Hall. I'll find out before we wrap up tonight and, and tell you all that. Um, so that's good. Um, the last piece is, you know, as, as you all have discussed, and I think we'll have further discussion about 133, um, the mayor and our office have, the mayor has asked us as staff and certainly is supportive of the concept of um, incentives, particularly for rental, uh, for-profit um, housing in the workforce space, and then also to consider what home buyer incentives look like as well. We have made some progress along those lines. Um, it's been a great collaboration, I think, between um, my office planning and then Matt Wilshire and the ECD office as well. And um, really looking at some of our models for how we've done other types of incentives within the government. Um, we don't have a draft for you today, but we do have an ongoing conversation that's happening between finance, legal, uh, mayor's office and planning. And so one of the things we want to do with our concept is test it out with you all, test it out with for-profit developers, um, but we're pretty excited about the direction that it's going and can talk a little bit more about that um, as we go. I, I think though you also want an update related to 133, so I thought I'd turn that over to Carrie and then if you have questions or want more details from us, any of the three of us can, can add to that. Before you do that, uh, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Cole? Councilman Hastings. Yes, Mr. Cole, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know you, you are used to hearing from me, but I, I just have to segue because there, there are several things that, especially with this Barnes Fund, that has been very, very near to my heart, and uh, I have not heard anything, but just to catch everyone up on this, from my understanding, because I was not here with the prior council, that the prior council did uh, the Barnes Fund plan based on home ownership. Uh, it has been segue to where there has been rental as well, and uh, when I ask that question, I hear that we're doing rental as well. So I didn't know that, but we go from there to where actually on my street that I live on, uh, there are a couple of barns fund housing, houses, which are in District 2. Uh, one of the houses were shot up. Uh, another house had a door kicked down. Uh, that is, uh, the neighbors are wearing me out right now because they're saying that's our tax dollars, not federal, but local tax dollars. Nobody is able to give me any other information. Uh, you know, I know Eric has been, been working really, really hard on trying to get avenues, and I know Eric doesn't do everything there, but we have to find a better way to 
deal with some of the issues that we have. Then the other segment that we're dealing with as well is not only the nonprofit versus the for-profit builders. Uh, nonprofit is only able to do so much building in the class to where we have within our areas. And I know District 2, it's only so much. We have had an over, overwhelmingly uh, amount of nonprofit builders that are there. Uh, we're looking for another upbuild. Uh, style of building, and for-profits are willing to do some of the work. Uh, I wanted to hear uh, from, from the mayor's office and Eric, where are we right now with that? And then as well as the tax properties, uh, you know, since I've been here, uh, we, we have been looking to try to see what can we do because there is a freeze on tax properties with other developers trying to come in. And it was saying that we were waiting for the bonds fund to finish up what they're doing. Now that we have moved on several months later, we're still in the same place. Now we still have a housing shortage but we have other developers and other individuals that would like to play a part in helping us in this housing game. I would like if I could get an update on those three items within that, and uh, I thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I mean, I think your questions and your urgency are exactly the kinds of things that keep us moving and, and wanting to be uh, swift, but also responsible in our actions. Um, your first point, um, I hope you've been in contact with that owner. We've tried to communicate your concerns um, related to that property um, with the owner. From what we understand, I mean, this is he's followed all of his landlord-tenant rules and, and regulations. Certainly what we have in place is similar to what you would see in place in other funding, in other funding entities. I, I will say there is federal dollars in that program, in that um, development. It's got home dollars that uh, MDHA monitors and regulates very closely also. So we want to be respectful and work with you on the neighborhood concerns um, and have encouraged the owner to talk with you and your neighbors. Um, from what we can tell, he is following everything appropriately. Um, that doesn't mean that ameliorates your concerns. I, I understand that. Um, we're just the funder and um, we try to not put too much um, over-regulation on our grantees because we've heard from them they need to be able to develop the product and get those get those um, open. On the property issue, um, yes, it's taken a long time. Actually, we have not finished round two of the Barnes Fund um, projects, and it's not really for lack of trying. It is a ongoing conversation that I'm happy to uh, talk with you about. The Barnes Commission has been really engaged in this back and forth. Um, we really are trying to get the deed restrictions and the leases correct so that if we give a property to a nonprofit developer, we have some protections as a government that it doesn't get sold in five years for double or triple the value. That's what we're ostensibly trying to figure out. Some of the nonprofits are comfortable with the compliance mechanism to make sure that doesn't happen. Others are not. So we're, we're figuring that piece out. Um, legal's been great and responsive. Um, but we literally have not brought those resolutions to you all because um, we're still ironing those pieces out. So I, I, I know you're impatient. I know your developers are impatient. Um, I, I still think we're doing the right thing because we're keeping properties off of just going out to the general market where we will eventually be able to put them out with some affordability or constraints that this committee has asked for. Um, the third piece around, you, you teed up the workforce incentive conversation perfectly. That's what we're trying to resolve and, and work out um, at kind of the behest of this committee is how we can do um, a grants program based upon um, the, the property taxes that properties will create over time. And I, if you all want to hear, I, Matt does probably the best description of the concept of any of us, and I'd be happy to let Matt kind of fill you in on that, or um, we can go on with questions. Matt, you want to just give a quick? Uh, I have a lot of people on the queue. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'd love for uh, Mr. Matt to come uh, some other time and explain this to us, but I'd like to go through a whole queue if that's okay with you. Councilman Davis. Thank you, Chair. Eric, thanks. Uh, appreciate it. It's exciting when we've got the $16 million. Um, I was just going to ask, um, 
is some of that for rehab, like rebuilding together type of thing, or MDHA's weatherization type of program? So the, the concept at this point is just um, kind of buckets that we want the commission to, to, to consider in terms of, you know, do you want 20 percent of the 10 million or the 16 million to go to X? You know, right. 20, the pie. As we slicing. sketch that out, one of those buckets is for um, homeowner rehab. So yes, the, probably the quickest way to do that is grants, either through MDHA or to existing nonprofits. And, and the, that would be new for us. I mean, okay. It's a new category for bonds, right, so we have to. But yeah. And the public, I mean, every time we've kind of thrown that out there publicly, it seems like we're getting a good response, or maybe that's just in our echo chamber. But I feel like that's oh, that no. is the case in general. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I was going to ask. So with the nonprofits, it's people like Urban Housing Solutions, that kind of company that. So th do they, they're applying for grants. Will you just, once you decide those buckets, you'll say, okay, we have $5 million for building homes or something yeah. or apartments. So traditionally, the first two rounds, y'all will not recall, but the first two rounds were synced up with the MDHA home application process and home dollars. These rounds will not be it synced up in terms of the application process and the, the mechanics and the dollars. They... Our hope, though, is to create a funding cycle that's pretty similar to what other funders do, so that MDHA's home funds, THDA's tax credit um, uh, awards, the Tennessee, um, Tennessee has an affordable housing trust fund as well that's just started funding. So we probably, what we're considering is two rounds a year, um, and we'd have to, you know, the commission will have to determine how many dollars to put into each one of those rounds, but we'll have a pretty thorough RFP process as we did in, in rounds one and two. Um, you have to be a qualified nonprofit. Um, we try to stack the standards so that people aren't jumping into the nonprofit, you know, uh, overnight, pool yeah. overnight right. and using these dollars. Um, so we've got a pretty rigorous, and the housing fund still helps us. They're still our um, body that helps us screen and, and score all those applications. Um, but I think that's conceptually where we're going. It's pretty similar to the way we've done it before. Um, but yes, you named a couple of our grantees, um, you know, Woodbine Community Organizations, another right, one, mm -hmm. Be a Helping Hand Foundation, and others. There's nothing to prevent a private developer from partnering, a new level community development corporation is another one. There's nothing to prevent a private developer from partnering with one of those nonprofits. What we're hearing from you and what the constituency is talking about is this additional program though um, to incentivize uh, affordable and workforce rental and home buyer and that's the larger legislative conversation that y'all have started. And are they, are they coming to you with a project that we've got a project you know, yes. that's shovel ready or you're like, hey, there's this land out there? They are typically, in the first two rounds, they had to have their zoning in hand. Okay. Uh, they had to have site control. Now, in round two, we had the metro properties, so that changed that a little bit. Right. They could ask for money and land, and we think we, I mean, we still have, as Councilman Hastings indicated, we still have additional metro properties, single family, that we can um, use in these subsequent rounds. Um, but typically, they had to prove their financing was pretty well together. Mm -hmm. uh, There's a whole, you know, the threshold of a, a very stringent process around um, applying for these dollars. Because as Councilman Hastings points out, I mean, these are property tax. I mean, these are general fund dollars. Sure. So. And, and deed restrictions that we're at, is it 20, 30 year that we're doing? Or uh, I typically, we we've were. been at 20 or, or uh, 20 is what we've had, uh, is what we're considering in this current round. Um, related to the round two of the Barnes properties. Okay. I'll just remind everyone that Austin, if it is city owned, Austin does 99 year deed restrictions basically forever. Wow. Um, if it's only when it's city owned, I think they do, you know, a lot of 30 year programs on other types of affordable housing. So it's basically because, you know, land continues to get tighter and tighter and rarer and rarer. It's hard to say rarer, um, but so they do a 99 year when it's city owned property. So anyway, we just need to be thinking about those nuances and, and with deed restrictions and to preserve affordable for long term. Thank you. Good, Thank great you job, Eric. So uh, Councilman Slitch. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. Eric gave a great um, summary of kind of what we've been dealing with on the commission. And I, I wanted to uh, assure uh, my colleagues that this commission is doing a lot of work. I mean, you have you have citizens who are dedicating three hour blocks at a time um, to be 
um, going over all of this work. And OEOE has done a great job of providing us sort of a roadmap for these percentages that we're talking about. Um, one of the things we are working on as well, when you hear about nonprofit partners who are applying, you know, um, OAOE has a list that's probably north of maybe 50 organizations at this point that are either doing affordable housing or want to do affordable housing, but many of these organizations do not have uh, maybe the capacity or they don't know where to start. And so one of the things we've been looking at in this funding is providing a source that we can you know, bring in a consultant or provide for the, f the training for these affordable housing leaders to be able to get the knowledge and capacity necessary to then go out and apply for subsequent rounds of Barnes funding. So what we're doing here is not only increasing the amount of funds that we're putting in, but we are also trying to increase the capacity of the organizations um, to use those funds to the best of their ability. So um, the commission, after we meet Thursday after this work session, my hope is that we will have at least a working draft of the legislation to bring to the council to, sh to show, hey, here is how we are kind of expanding that scope to include many of the things we've just discussed, including homeowner rental rehab, um, but it would also include the scope of, of nonprofit capacity building as well. It's, that's uh, important because we are waiting on all the other four legislations to have it line up with yours. So um, we, I mean, I don't mean to put any more pressure, but uh, the sooner the better so we can issue the, all the five pieces of legislation. Sure, and, and what I would encourage us is, is if we get to the point where if we look at the other four and they're ready to go and everybody department-wise and everything feels comfortable with it, I, I would ask you that we not wait because the commission is working toward all of these issues. And I can, as we've talked about on the commission, we are not going to spend 10 million, 11 million dollars, you know, the first two weeks of the fiscal year. And so we, we are wanting to make sure we get the guidelines right. And I don't want us to delay any other actions that we might take to increase affordability in the city while we get those together. It is, it is moving along well, and there's been a lot of work done. Um, we've just had a lot more framework to build, honestly. So if we get to that point, I would ask my colleagues, let's, let's not wait if, if, if that's what's necessary. Council McCollman? Okay. Uh, thank you, Sledge. Uh, back to uh, Councilman Hastings. You still want us? I just wanted to say the follow-up uh, to be able to give you the, uh, the opportunity to give him the floor, but say uh, thanks, Eric. I didn't get a chance to say that before for all that you do, because I know you're doing a, a tough and a big job right now, uh, but uh, we need just as much help as we can on this side of the field. And I know you know, out of all people, as being a councilman yourself, uh, but I will yield my time uh, to, if we would, Mr. Chair, allow them to say what they have to say about the, the housing fund. to go? Sure. So um, I, there are, as we've just talked about, three or four pieces of legislation, 133 and 134. And I think where we are at the moment is, um, I'll take a step back, the, the rental piece and the for sale piece. The rental piece, I think we have figured out fairly well on the incentives. Um, the for sale piece is, is fairly complex only because each and every development is inherently tremendously different. But we have discovered, we've worked through the consultant and carry a structure that we think actually works really well, um, is somewhat, um, will be somewhat uh, novel in that it has not been done uh, across the country. And we believe will have the impact both of putting affordable housing where we want, I'm sorry, workforce housing, where we want to have workforce housing, uh, and we believe will actually spur additional development. Um, and so um, this is not to say that uh, we're not going to continue to move forward on the for sale piece. The analogy that we've been using is it's like building a house, uh, ironically. You don't use one tool to build a house. You need saws, you need hammers. There are different tools to try and address how we tackle workforce and affordable housing. So. The part that I'm going to talk about today is the approach to incentivizing 
uh, work for, uh, workforce housing uh, in rental units. Um, the for sale piece will continue to be a part of this legislation based upon the conversations that we've had, but it will be a voluntary opt-in basis. We understand from conversations with several of the council members that there is tremendous interest by developers in moving forward with the structure that the consultant and the planning department um, had come up with, but we've also heard from a lot of developers that if we imposed that structure that it would kill development in other areas, and I think one of the first things that we're uh, approached to this is we understand supply and demand economics. And the most important thing that we do is we don't disrupt the market because the best thing that we can do to bring down affordable housing, to bring, bring down housing prices, is to increase the supply. And so we don't want to kill off development. So the for sale piece will be an opt-in. There are developers who we think, we think are ready to move forward with that and can bring that online quickly. So the exciting part, the, the, the rental piece on developments. Um, the first principle is any property owner who has a piece of property today and whatever they can build by right today, they can build by right if this legislation passes. There is no taking of any right that any developer has anywhere, period, full stop. Uh, and that's an important overview of how we structure this. The second thing is um, we want to have the affordable housing, um, the workforce housing uh, in with the uh, higher cost. We believe that there are tremendous values to having rich folks and not as rich folks living together in the same place. It's better for a society, it's better for a community, and we think we've structured a way that can encourage that to happen as we all look to work together as a more integrated uh, community. And so the proposal is, if you, whatever you can build by right today, you can build by right if this legislation passes. But if you want some additional density bonuses uh, and you're coming to the city to ask for those, the trade-off is if you want density, which has tremendous economic value. Today, you might be able to build a, a building that would have 50 units in it, but you want to build a building that has 100 units in it. That density bonus has tremendous economic value. And if you're coming to ask for that from the city, the trade-off is that you put some affordable housing in your development. There is a matrix that has been um, distributed previously. It's been revised. The numbers have been worked on in, in consultation with the consultant. But let's, for the purposes of this conversation, say it's effectively 15% of the units in this building. And I'll go through one example of how this is all going to work as a, as a way of sort of illuminating philosophically where we're going. But uh, as Carrie and Eric said, all the details have not been worked out. We want you all to provide your input, uh, developers to provide their input so we have a structure that works. But the idea is you have a building, you can build 50 units. You want density bonuses so you can build 100 units. You build a 100-unit building, 15 of those units would be workforce housing. Um, it, it, let's call it 80 of MHI. MHI is uh, the, the, the new, the, the new uh, AMI is MHI, uh, which stands for median household income. So um, 15 of the units are going to be at 80 MHI in this new building that we're discussing hypothetically. Um, so that's a tremendous economic loss for the developer. But the second component of this is, one, they get density bonuses, which have real economic value. And two, under this proposal, the city, the, the taxes generated by this building would actually go to offset the cost for the developer. So as an example, let's say that you can build 50 units. You want to build 100 units. 15 of them are going to come online. You have a perfect comp set in that building, right? You're going to rent out 85 of those units for market rates unrestricted, whatever the market will bear. That's your comparison price on if they were all uh, market rate. And the 15 units, you can only charge X amount because it's governed by the median household income. It's 80% of that and not being rent bur cost burden. And so let's just say that your uh, market rate units are renting for $1,400 and your other units are renting for $900. I'm not sure that those are the exact numbers, but just for illustrative purposes. You're out $500 per unit per month times 12 months. You're out six grand and 15 units. What is that? $90,000? Uh, if I'm doing all the math correct, you're out $90,000. So the idea is um, at the end of each year, December 31st, you total up what the market rate was, and we're working on the details. It's got to be on a per square foot basis, and we want to set up enough rules and regulations that the developers aren't going to 
try and uh, rig the deal, but you're gonna say, look, I could have charged $1,400 for these units, I only charged $900, I'm out 90 grand. So by February 15th of each year, you report that to uh, the director of finance, along with an audit that comes at your cost, saying, look, here, here were the units I rented out, here's the amount that I was out, I'm out this amount of money, and that m amount will then put, be put into the budget, we hope, we believe, that would be the uh, obligation of the government to put it into the budget. So the budget that Talia would present to Mayor Barry would include the amounts from all the developers who've done affordable or workforce housing in their units to comply with this legislation. And the amount that they're out would then be put into the budget. And if passed by this council each year on a year-to-year -year basis, because you cannot bind future councils to this, um, it has to be approved, just like the incentive legislation we do for uh, economic development deals, then if it's approved by the council, the payment will be made in July. So I know what some of you uh, mathematicians are thinking about. Uh, first, there is a time value of money. The developers are out money in, let's just say that it was in place already. They're out money in calendar 15 for dollars that will be paid to them in July of 16. So there is a time value of money loss, which they are out. And there is a hassle factor, right? They now are having to track the income of folks who are living in 15 of their 100 units. Um, those are real costs, undoubtedly. Um, we think that we have offset that cost from their perspective for two reasons. First, 15 of their units are guaranteed leased up, period, full stop. I mean, if you're, these building, these rooms, uh, apartments are all gonna be built to the same spec, you're in a building that by definition is market rate, much higher rate uh, units, there's gonna be a line from here to Murfreesboro for these units because they're nice units um, in a, a place near transit, downtown area. So the pitch to developers is, first, we're gonna put affordable housing in the building, and that's just a good thing to do for the city, you should be happy about that, but the city's actually gonna pay you to put affordable housing in your building. You're out some money in the interim, time value money and the hassle factor, but you've got guaranteed lease up of 15% of your building before you've even built it, and there is real economic value to the density bonuses that you received in the front end. So while it's not dollar for dollar or everything offset, we believe that this is a structure that fairly uh, encourages developers without suppressing construction demand, encourages developers to build, put density, and put um, workforce housing in the areas that are close to transit and close to the areas where we want it. A, a, a couple of other sort of overall notes on this. The, the amount of units will depend upon the market demand and what sort of what gets built. And so you all will be monitoring this on a year by year basis as the budget comes up and the, and the, dollars, are, uh, the dollars are expended uh, in the program. Oh, one last piece. So, so where does this money come from, uh, you might ask? Uh, the consultants have run the numbers and estimate that for 15% of the units to be 80% MHI in a building, that it will essentially take 28% of the property taxes of that building. And so while all funds are fungible and dollars are sort of mixed and mingled and we've gotten into long conversations with, uh, with, with finance about this, essentially the building, the development, will pay for itself. We're paying, the city will still generate, based upon the consultant's estimates, 72% of the, of the property tax dollars, and those dollars go to teachers and parks and uh, greenways and all the other expenditures that the city has. Um, and 28% uh, and of the incremental property taxes generated by the project pay for the affordable housing. So we essentially, the unit itself is subsidizing and paying for the affordable housing in it. That is the structure of how we are doing all this. Um, Developers could say, look, I want to do more than 15%. I want to do 18%, 20%, 25%, 30%. And if the rental market starts to go soft, which some people have predicted might happen, I don't, I'm not one of those people, but then there is a mechanism to have additional workforce housing built into these developments. But there is a cap that we've discussed, which is no more than half of the property taxes from a particular project can go to this affordable housing. And the idea behind that is the city is still gonna be getting more property taxes to pay for all the other costs of the city. We don't want all the dollars consumed with affordable housing or workforce housing. Uh, and so in a little bit more than a nutshell, that's the structure.
Thank you, Mr. Wilshire. Uh, so, I mean, I have other people on the queue, but if does anybody want to ask a question to Mr. Wilshire? Who's that, Mr. Glover? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, question. So, uh, what I think I heard you say was the the for sale component is now out of 133. That's not even in the in there? It, it'll be in there, but it's going to be voluntary, not mandatory. Well, let's so, talk. I, I want to make sure I understand voluntary. So if somebody is zoned RS-15 now and they want to go to SP, mm -hmm. is it still voluntary? Yes, it would be if requested by the applicant. Okay. Mm -hmm. If requested by the applicant on the SP. So if, they, if the density is greater than what the RS-15 allows, then if they want to do affordable workforce, for sales, they could. If they didn't, if they said no, I don't want to do that, then we're no longer forcing them to do that under this. That that's the current line of thought. Yes. Okay. And then it, it looks like, um, and I just want to make sure I understand the math correctly. If if I if I figure properly, about 53 percent is what's going to be of the units will be abated back to the the property owner, rebated back. However, however we're going to do that. So at some point, let's say on 100 units, about 27 would be the cap, if, if in fact that is the, is the mathematical formula for how that's going to work. So are we going to build that in to protect the city to where it doesn't have all of a sudden uh, where we're actually losing money uh, on it? I mean, are we, are, we gonna, are we building in those safeguards? Yes. So, okay. So if the math is 15 units out of 100, if the math is 15 units out of 100 consumes 28% of the property taxes on the building, uh, that your math sounds right, that essentially above 27 units, more than 50%. And look, it's going to change over time, right? Because market conditions will change, what 80% of MHI is will change, what your market rate on your units will change. So none of these numbers are static numbers by definition. But yes, the short answer to your question, and it will change year to year. So developers don't have to worry about getting locked in or screwed out over time. The idea is it's as though we are essentially paying you to do market rate, but the one cap that we're putting in there is no more than 50% of the property taxes of the unit, of that building can go towards this affordable housing program, grant program. Right. The, the, the other side of this that concerns me candidly is, and we can't, we can't uh, bind uh, future councils. I, I get that piece of it. But one of the things that concerns me about this is if, in fact, we, we build this in and we all think this is a great idea today, and all of a sudden, six years from now, the next council doesn't think it's a great idea, and we built up this large number of affordable housing, what happens to those folks if the council says, nope, sorry. I mean, all of a sudden now we've created, we've created another problem because we haven't really addressed it properly uh, through sustainable funding for uh, wherever it is we're going to end up going on this. Yeah. I mean, w w we, that question is a very real question. And, and part of the reason that we wrote in the 50% cap on the incremental property taxes of that building is the idea that conceptually at least, you can say to somebody, hey, look, the affordability of this project is being paid for by this project. That's an, that's an easier thing to, uh, to sort of, for broad support, we hope. But you're right. I mean, it could end up that a council says, wow, we've got 450 or 5,000 units of uh, workforce housing, and we're just not going to pay for it this year. Uh, for whatever reason, because there's an economic crisis or whatever, I mean, that would be an incredibly disruptive uh, event to occur to the development community, to the affordable housing community. I mean, I, my guess is most of those people would not be reelected, but uh, beyond that issue, I mean, you know, we, we built it in to do that. I'll also add that there's a provision in the zoning portion that says that the affordable housing is only required as long as financial incentives are available. Right. Right. I mean, I, I get that piece of it, but, but again, I think the, the concern that I have is, is very real, uh, number totally. one. And if we go back to 2008, the end of 2008 and 2009, that would be the economic downturn that we're talking about, I think, that could actually trigger the potential of this occurring in very real time. Yes. Uh, and, and ironically, however, it is that exact economic condition that theoretically would solve the issue of affordable housing, right? Because in, that, in the economic conditions you're describing, rents would theoretically be falling because of the macroeconomic conditions. And so the incentive, the delta between 80% MHI and 
uh, and market rate would probably be compressed in those conditions. The market doesn't react instantaneously. So I, I don't, I don't no. mean to be too cute about this, but, but under those economic conditions, there, there would be a variety of levers that would all be going at the same time. And yes, there could be pressure on a council to pull the plug, not fund it, and well, the only people will be kicked out of the houses. Yeah, the, the reason apartments. I bring it up, and, and I'll close with this, Chair, is that if we go back and we study the, the revenues that were coming into the city during that time frame, spe specifically sales tax revenues, it dropped drastically. And so, therefore, some hard decisions had to be made. And I, I guess I'm just looking at where's the safety valve uh, on this. So that, that's, that's my question. Thank, hey, thank you, you, Chair. Chair. Councilman Scott Davis, you were next on the queue. Ah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Cole, are we back to questions for Eric? Uh, yeah, I didn't know who you wanted to talk to. Thank you, Mr. Wilshire. Yes, go ahead. I certainly appreciate your hard work and Mr. Sledges and also Ms. Logan always with the Planning Commission there. Um, Kind of looking forward, and if you've answered this already, please forgive me. Are you, you can someone, if, there, if we finally get away, which looks like we're getting close to where a developer is going to build affordable housing, true affordable housing, and they're for profit, is there a way to help offset some infrastructure costs? And if you've already said that, I apologize, sir, but. That's one of the things that's hurting, and I know we can't really help out with water fees or anything like that, because that's there's some federal stuff involved, but maybe some infrastructure as far as roads and sidewalks and paving and things. If you can talk about that, sir. Well, absent the, I mean, what we've talked about um, in terms of the this proposed grants legislation, um, the, the concept of other fee reductions or, you know, other ways to speed up the process are very much things that we're, we're looking at, but no, there are not um, specific infrastructure improvements that we're looking at in addition to this. Do you want to add something? Yeah. For a rental project with the program that Matt just described, um, that then takes the affordable housing project to basically a market rate project and therefore make some of those infrastructure costs much more doable at that point. So basically, if, um, let's just say I have a plot of land, I'm gonna build three market rate houses and then a f affordable one. Same looking unit, three bedroom, two bath, everything the same. Um, because I'm doing one unit maybe at 130,000 and the other three are at 320,000, you know what I mean? I couldn't possibly get, let's just say, a grant to help with the sidewalk or the road or whatnot. Yeah. Well, you could ask for them to study if that's something that you want them to do. I mean, this is the committee. You, if you, if that's something that's important to you, go ahead could and. Could you look at that, please? Sure. Sure. I mean, Thank you. So, so part of the part of the legislative positioning of all this is you all have 133, I think, on first reading tomorrow night, and I know there's been work done or there is work happening around a substitute le related to that legislation. As Carrie indicated, it's got you know language in it says it won't go forward without an incentives program. We've come along, you know, in the, in the again, as I said, the mayor said, you know, go help figure out incentives. So that's that's what this early conversation is, and and to. Matt's point and some of the earlier points around, and certainly Councilman Glover's point around funding. Um, you know, we've got work still to do with finance and, and legal to, to figure out what the parameters look like. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the, the legislative uh, tool that we're talking about is, is, is very much in your hands. Thank you. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to commend the work of planning and, and others who've been working through 133 very, very diligently. Um, and I'm very pleased to hear that we're getting the rental right, it sounds like. We're getting it to where it makes it sort of net zero and economically um, viable. On the for sale portion, I did want to give folks an idea of, you know, when we look at it being voluntary, there is a value to that. Um, because there are some of us who 
we have plots of land in our district where we are literally going, we have proposals for increases of entitlements that are way, way, way higher than what we had initially looked at with the consultants earlier this year. I, I have one in my district where we would go literally from the zoning would allow six units and we are looking at the possibility of doing 24 units. And so when you look at that kind of number, it creates the opportunity, and in that case in particular, which is before this council tomorrow night, um, the applicant is voluntary, voluntarily complying with 133, and these are for sale units. So I just want to make sure that that folks know that we talk about it being voluntarily, you know, that people can voluntarily comply. You might think, oh, that's not going to happen. It, it is happening. Um, the the fact of the matter is, we do have areas where entitlements are so great, and the increase and the conversation. Sorry, I don't know. That's all right. Uh, the, the conversations between us and the development community can take place in a way that makes it make sense for them to be able to use that grant program, just like we're talking about for the rental, but it's a, it's a little bit different. That grant program for for sale, and we can create for sale affordable and workforce housing. So it is it is possible, and I, and I do, I am very much encouraged by, by the progress that's been made. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And before I bring the next person, we still need to hear from. Uh, from Kerry, and uh, but before that, uh, we also need to make some decisions tonight if we are going to how we're going to move forward. And it's 15 minutes to an hour, and I don't want you guys to kill me for letting this meeting run too long. So, uh, Councilman Weeders, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, perhaps I might possibly be able to direct this question back to Ms. Logan and, and Mr. Cole. I really appreciate the comments from my colleague Scott Davis about um, infrastructure costs, which can be significant in some cases. We do have some sites that are just really difficult to put sidewalks in and things of that nature. Having said all that, I really want to express concern about um, being lenient uh, in sidewalk requirements, I think it's my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that at some point in time, Metro um, made a decision not to require sidewalks to reduce sidewalk fees for development impacts, and that is a, arguably a big portion of why we're in the situation that we're in today with some of our infrastructure lack in our neighborhoods, and so I, I want to offer a point counterpoint, I guess, to Mr. Davis, uh, my colleague, uh, about that. That I think that while affordable housing is good, you know, the the trade-off of having one or a very small number of affordable housing units in exchange for not having sidewalks for eternity uh, or at significant cost to Metro uh, may not necessarily be a good trade-off for a city long term. And so, if you do that that type of analysis. Um, Please keep in mind what the long-term cost of Metro is for uh, for infrastructure upgrades. So number one, I just wanted to, to raise that point. But uh, another point I wanted to ask if, if there's been any consideration on, which is that in m most of our neighborhoods, um, affordable housing is being removed through demolition. Mm -hmm. And so is there a uh, consideration for uh, any any types of incentives for people basically not to demolish houses, whether through fees or through other types of, of incentives to keep some of our existing small houses there. Uh, to your first point, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Eric on the demolition. Um, in my experience, most of the developers that we have coming to us who are truly doing affordable housing developments are aware that the people that they expect to occupy the developments will need pedestrian improvements and access to transit. And so when we have those conversations about providing sidewalks or or what routes to transit are, all of them are very open to that. I haven't experienced sort of that roadblock of it's too costly to provide those. And then on your second question, um, yeah, the grants program or the, the Barnes Fund is considering, and that's one of those, those bucket elements of a grant's potential for um, uh, disincentivizing demolition as well. Thank you. Uh, Council Lady Allen. Actually, I was just going to ask if we could hear Carrie's sort of update on where 133 is and then make the decision of we probably do want to defer because I think the grants program needs to be ready to go at the same time if we have any thoughts on 
if that's a two, two meeting deferral or, or longer. Thank you. My update is, is very short because both Matt and Eric have talked about it. It's mostly been working with them on the for sale aspect. I haven't made any changes to 133 because we wanted to hear from the committee about uh, uh, regarding the conversation about making for sale completely voluntarily, uh, voluntary at the request of the applicant. That's it? That's it. Oh, wow. That's then, short. Then I would, can I ask another question? Yeah. If we make it voluntary, do we have a, a um, a grant for the for sale, is there still some amount that's kind of a token amount? Because it really doesn't make them whole, is there? Or do we just forget that part since it's really not meaningful? What there could be a grant along with, as Matt talked about, the the value of the density that they're requesting. So mm -hmm. what we'd be essentially be doing is relying on the developer to put in any of their, in their specific pro forma for that specific development, whether they can make affordable housing work with both the density increase and, and the grant, potentially. Okay. Well, we definitely need to have a lot to think about. Uh, all right, thank you. And then one other thing. Um, I just passed out for everybody to look at the, um, the draft of the resolution about the com comprehensive plan, which I've worked with the mayor's office, OEOE, on um, just kind of describe what the big picture is and that they have, they have generously agreed uh, to that also to sort of be the overseer of all the things that are going on, just so somebody has a, an idea you know, of what all the needs are and who's doing what and what's not being done so that we can continue to be, be mindful of trying to fill in all the, all the gaps. So I would, I would ask people to look that over and, um, and that one may not need to wait with the other ones. It, if we're happy with it, that one actually could go fairly soon. Um, so everybody got a copy of it. If y'all would look it over and um, send comments back through Rosie, then maybe we could finish that one up pretty soon. Well, I guess I can ask you uh, by raising your hands if you guys want to wait to have everything together or if you guys want to start issuing some of this legislation ahead of time. Uh, Councilman Sledge. Uh, would it help, Chair, if we, if we made a distinction between what takes one vote or reading and what takes three? Because I know 133 will take three, but we, we'll have resolutions like the one Council Lady Allen has that'll just take one. So uh, if we want to put them all together, I don't know if we want to. That's a good point. Well, I need, I need the feedback from you all. We decided together as a committee to wait, and uh, now there is a conversation about facing them in, so I just need you guys to tell me how you want to handle it. Councilman Mendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, d I didn't get a copy of the comprehensive plan one. Um, thank you, Councilman Sledge. Um, <laughs> but uh, knowing that uh, uh, Council Member Allen, I'm sure, did a great job, um, I would be in favor of just having us go ahead with the resolution for the comprehensive plan. Um, because uh, I, I, I don't I didn't hear us get to the finish line on what happens with 133 but I'm assuming it's gonna have first reading deferred at least two meetings again is my guess um, and so I would be in favor of this resolution going forward and uh, um, just going ahead and pulling the trigger on the um, changes to the pilot program that we've talked about Can I get a uh, vote by raising your hand who's in favor of this all right thank you how about uh, the other uh, three or four? I mean, are we uh, are we going to start issuing them until as as they are ready, or or what's the the wish of the committee? May I? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I don't I don't I'm I don't have strong feelings, so whatever the committee wants. But um, for me. Uh, we've got 133 in the grants. Um, those are going to have to go together, and so we're, you know, it'll be ready when it's re when it's ready. It feels like, and then the other one is going to be the um, uh, one about Barnes Housing Fund, which I'm sorry I walked in late, so I don't know whether we've talked about that or not yet. Um, but I think that that one should go whenever it's ready to go. To Councilman Mendez's question, we have a work session Thursday for the commission. I expect to have a working draft come out of that, and then we'll be putting it together. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's a 
one vote resolution as as well. I'm not totally sure about that. And maybe the mayor's office is telling me they don't know either. But I think it is, but, we'll, but I'll double check on it to be sure. But within the next couple of weeks, I expect to have the draft ready to roll. So what I'll do is I'll ask uh, Mike Jamison to put together a, a schedule of you know which ones require one vote or three votes, and uh, n knowing that we are all agreed to do the one to the mayor's office, that that. That one is separated. We already agree on that. On the other ones, I'll send you the information, and then you all can tell me how you want to move forward. Uh, okay, I have uh, Councilman Hastings uh, wanted to speak again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quickly here, and not trying to go back. I know we are having a long day, and going to have a long day tomorrow. But uh, just back over to, and Mr. Chair, you were here uh, on the last council, and I'm not sure if you could please explain, and I'll ask all my questions first, and then I'll let you guys do. If you could please explain the process that happened on the last council on what the Barnes Fund was supposed to be so that we would have a better understanding on where we are, the way that we are supposed to move with this, not it being made up every step of the way, but what was it in your mind at the time of you guys passing the Barnes Fund, what is it supposed to be? Uh, number two is, uh, I don't know, just in clarification on where the, who decides, and I kind of, uh, it looks like the, the developer decides on rental or, or um, uh, sell properties. Uh, the developer decides that, that, uh, that going out, but what if we fall into a sector, which in my area where Barnes Farm housing are, we are falling into a place to where all of those houses are rental properties and the homeowners that are around are having problems with that because we're developing another sector of, of issues that we as the Metro Council or the leadership that's here actually looked at. Now, I can't talk about anybody else's uh, uh, district or anybody else's facility or barns uh, houses are. I can only speak to my community and what my community is dealing with. Uh, and also, I wanted to see if we could get a timeline or a, an update on a continual basis of what's going on with the tax properties and where we are on a continual basis on getting closer to the segment of working with uh, uh, for-profit developers. And I know I have some for-profit guys that I know, and I know also know some guys that are working with the, the Barnes Fund now. But I know there's some other things that we need to have done within our communities. Again, my district has been hit by a continuous overlapping of nonprofit developments, and we deserve more and we should get more. So an update, just being able to let us know what is going on because we're not a part of that, uh, I'm not a part of that meeting, and I know we have a great representative that is here with the council that is doing a, a, a spectacular job, but just to let us know so we will understand where we can play uh, a part in this game. Thank you. Yeah, I I wanted to finish the meeting in four minutes. If I start telling you the story of the Barnes Fund, we may be in here in a half an hour. <laughs> but, what, but the one thing I do want to tell you is that you have a great opportunity working on the legislation that uh, uh, Councilman Sledge is doing because the Barnes Fund is going to be the one that is going to be responsible for, for this using all this money. So if you want to have an input on how that money is being spent, that is really where you want to get involved with, is in looking at that legislation and see what guidelines are being set on how to spend that money. So I will encourage you to get involved in reviewing that legislation and providing feedback on that. Uh, who gets appointed to the Barnes Fund? You know, what powers do they have? Uh, how do they get to, you know what I mean? So I, it's not so much of how we used it before, but to your concern is how will it be used in the future. So I will encourage you to do that. And as to the rest, I think you can ask the mayor's office to give you an update, and we hold them accountable. Thank you. All right. If 
I don't have anybody else asking questions, so if it's okay with everybody, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. I'd l I, I really appreciate all of you taking the time to come to this meeting, and uh, I know uh, we'll get there, so thank you very much. <laughs>